the 30th of March, and we are continuing our study of the book of Matthew. This morning, we'll be looking uh, specifically, at, specifically at Matthew chapter 4, um, but the presenter or presenter is Claude Joseph, and uh, he'll be taking over from here. Go ahead, Claude. All right. All yours. Yes, it's good morning, pleasant Sabbath to all. And uh, before we before we delve into the word, let me um let us pray, eternal God and our Father. It is with joyful hearts we approach you, O God, and as we delve into your word, into your truth, we we beg that your spirit will be with us. Thou art the teacher. So we ask of you, O Lord, through your spirit, you illuminate. May all that we say, God, bring praise and honor and glory unto thee, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This morning we are looking at we are looking at Matthew chapter 4. And this morning I'm going to, before we get into chapter 4, I'm going to I'm going to go back and take a look at uh, John the Baptist. And <clears throat> the reasons for this is I was impressed to do that because um the reason for this, I will, I will, I'll present in a little while, uh, but I will start off by, <clears throat> by. I'll start off this way in Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three, John was introduced to us. Matthew chapter three, and in verse thirteen of the same chapter, we saw Jesus baptizing. I'm sorry, so Matthew, um, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus Christ. And we go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, and it reads, and I quote, Verily, verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, they have not, they have been, not been, they have not Reason a greater, sorry, reason one greater than John the Baptist. I'm just going to use that part of the text. And the, the reading it from the words, it was in red. So that obviously was the voice of, from my Bible, I could tell. It was Jesus speaking. And Jesus is making a claim here that among the prophets who preceded John, there was none greater than him. And when you look at John, for a brief period of time, John came, did what he had to do, and go back. And when you contrast him against giants like Moses, David, Solomon, Isaiah, you, you ask yourself the question, then is God saying something here that I missed? Because all along, I read John, the John uh, I, I read the life of John the Baptist, what he did, and we all associate him with the one crying in the wilderness, the one who, who was the forerunner to Jesus. And, and we kind of ended that, that way, not, not giving so much um, credence to him in terms of what he did. And, and and as short as he comes and leaves, again, he doesn't leave. He, he, we don't see he have the amount of years like, like Moses. I mean, David starts to rule at the age of 30. He dies around, say, 40 years on ruling. And, and the exploits of David, the kinds of things. David was not, not only a king, but David was also a prophet, you know. And... This is the guy that was tasked to expand the borders of Israel, 
unify Israel. And, and so when you look at things David did from the standpoint of a prophet, from the standpoint of a, of a king, you look at, you look at the, the iconic figure of Moses, um, his length of days, and what Moses accomplished. Um, if you ask any, anybody about, you know, maybe one of your most, one of the, your, your favorite Bible characters, quite a few people will, 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 will mention Moses. And, and we're all aware of what Moses did. But yet still, Jesus Christ is making a statement. And he's saying, and he's saying, among those, hold on, let me just get it back again. Right. And he's saying, very, very, I see unto you, among them that are born of women, they have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So I, I, I'm looking at this and, and I'm, I'm impressed to look a little deeper in terms of what about John the Baptist that probably we missed that is pointing to us. It, it's in your face and probably we're not seeing. What about, what about him that 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 Jesus is making reference to him as as the greatest that has been from from a woman that, that that's the greatest prophet. What about him? Uh, <laughs> so let's <coughs> sorry. And so we, we're going to look at uh, a little bit of uh, Moses. We're going to look at this, this, the accomplishments of Moses, and we're going to put it alongside. And at the end of it all, we're going to look at we're going to see well whether or not. Um, we're going to try to figure out well what the Lord was actually saying when He gave um, those kinds of props, those kinds of uh, that kind of um, esteem, the position to 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 to, to John. Uh, first of all, let us let us look at um, let's look at um, um, let's look at the life of Moses and to see. The, the 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 kind of figure the, the giant that he was uh, this this is a guy who grew up in ro royalty uh, called by God spends forty he spends his first forty years in, in royalty learning um, probably going to the best schools being involved in the activities then God calls him um, well civil, uh, situation arises that brought about some sort of sibling sibling rivalry that uh, pushes him out. He heads to 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 the desert where he meets um, the family of Jethro. He marries into that, and God speaks with him. And 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 we see here in the desert, Mo Moses Moses' path really begins where he writes the first uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah, as we as we as we commonly understand it. And again, just <laughs> if we had to stop there, that in and of itself is is a significant. Is a significant um, contribution to 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 what um, to not just to humanity, but to to the to the to the nation of Israel. But I don't stop here. God calls him again, and a people that has been on, in bondage for four hundred for over four hundred years. God tasks him with the responsibility of of as that deliverer to bring his people back. From 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 bondage for all these years, and for his people to worship him, and this is no this is no this is no easy task because this is the greatest power of the day, the greatest power of the day, the greatest economy, best infrastructure, influence all over. You know, I mean, we looked at Greece, we look at Europe. Europe, Europe foundation was built upon. The intellect of, of 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 Egypt and what they've read. So it was a powerful, powerful navigation, trading of goods from all over the place. You know, that, that was Egypt for you. So this is this is the America of the day. And here is God sending a guy with a stick to challenge. And at the end of the day, Moses goes. And when Moses leaves, when Moses 
is done with Egypt. Let's look at some of the things that happens to let's look at some of the things that happens to Egypt. At the end of that exercise, the duration of time, we have a king dies, his army almost destroyed, the heir to the throne is, is, is gone. The economy of Egypt is either on the brink of collapse or it has totally collapsed. We see diseases in a land that probably they have never seen before. We've seen changes in the, we've seen phenomena in the heavens that people never saw. And all of that is coming by the way of Moses. And just when you think this thing is over, the guy takes, he pulls out about two million people that provided essential labor for the growth and development of the country. He pulls them out and creating a, 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 further, a further economic mess, the shortage of labor, um, growth and expansion is going to come to a, a halt as a result of, of the activity of pulling out labor, which again is free labor. Then he leaves and he, he, spoils, he spoils the Egyptians, he takes their cow, he takes their gold, he takes their dresses, and he lives. This is the figure we're talking about here. This is the accomplishment of, of a guy not coming with an army, but with a stick alongside his brother. So when you when you, 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 you look at this guy, you know, you look at this guy, and then you look at another hero. In, 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 in Israel, a guy called David, and David comes on the scene about maybe about 400, 440 years after, after the initial entry. And David, and, and David is now being tasked to expand the borders of Israel, unify Israel, create a single monarchy, and, 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 and really creates a, a formidable a formidable nation with a thriving economy. So when you look at you look at Moses and you look at David and you look at the accomplishments, we're not seeing that John the Baptist is doing anything of those, anything near that kind of stuff. But yet still, yet still, God is uh, Jesus is making a statement that of those born to women, there's none greater. So is Jesus? speaking about something physical or is Jesus speaking something completely different that makes him or puts him in the in the rank in that class by himself what exactly is Jesus saying that causes us to to really ponder over the statement as to who exactly is this guy and why he why, what role did he do what was his accomplishment that caused Jesus to make that statement. Was Jesus talking on the physical realm or was he talking on the spiritual realm? I and I will I will hasten to add that Jesus could not be speaking about physical accomplishments of John the Baptist. He could not be looking at something physical. It had to go beyond. It had to go beyond the physical. Again, you see, you, this guy, this, this guy, or under his, on, on his, under his leadership, we saw in the no, but let, let's, go, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back a little bit. John the Baptist, going back to um, Daniel chapter 9, and uh, we're beginning to look at the guy himself. We're looking at John the Baptist himself. And 
we try to make sense out of him to see, well, you know, if he's a special breed, what about him that is so special? Daniel chapter 9 <clears throat> speaks to Daniel reading the, the reading the book of Jeremiah. And it was about the time that God was about to deliver um, the Jews from the captivity in Babylon. And, 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 and Daniel is reading that and it's giving Daniel a little bit of a problem. And God dispatches Gabriel. God dispatches Gabriel to explain to Moses what he's reading. Now, the reason why I find that is that has great importance because Daniel chapter 9, the chapters down, is a messianic prophecy. It's, 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 it's as messianic as in all the prophet in, in all the prophecies. This is this is you know this is a this prophecy gives you it announces the the, the the Messiah when Messiah would come when he would die when he would be when he would be anointed for the, you know Daniel chapter nine and and God gives God gives um God gives Gabriel he tasks Gabriel with that job to go to Daniel and explain to Daniel that whole prophecy. Now, Daniel's interaction with the angel is about 500 and something years before the Messiah would have showed up. But what was interesting here is when Daniel received the understanding from from, from Gabriel, who was dispatched by God to him specifically, the next time we saw Gabriel showed up on the scene was when he delivered the message to Joseph and he delivered a message to Zachariah, who is the father of John the Baptist. Now let's put this into perspective a little bit. I believe heaven has a hierarchy. There are angels, and the work of the angels is to is to do God's bidding. They go on errands for God, do God's bidding. But in that particular case of the angel coming to Daniel, and five hundred years later he's coming to uh, with with a vision, and five hundred years later he's coming to Zechariah and he's coming to Joseph. It tells me something very, very important. It have me looking at the guy, looking at the angel, Gabriel. And my understanding, and subject to correction, but Gabriel sits at the top. You understand? He is, he is I think, a replacement of Lucifer, if I'm not mistaken. Now, let's just look at the, the regular army or regular police force. From the commissioner down to the last constable, they are members of the police force. Most of the times, when the prime minister of a country or president of a country has to do, um, there are certain things that they have to do or certain um, relationship they establish or certain um, engagements that they have, they send the, the, uh, a person from the army. But the person that they're sending is a very, very high-ranking person. In that case, the head of the army, as in the case of the U.S. The US. There's a number of things that the, the, the U.S., the head of the, the Joint Chief of Staff does, a number of things, the economic, political, you know, representing the country on, on several different things. Most of that is not really in the news, but he does a lot. And similarly, we are more used to the structure in, in the Caribbean. We look at uh, the highest ranking member being the, the commissioner. And so here, here we have God is sending a message. God is, God is going to do something. And he's not using like a, in the police force, we have the rank, we have the constable, corporal, station sergeant, inspector, assistant superintendent, superintendent, deputy commissioner of police, commissioner of police. That's the rank. And 
So let's just call Gabriel the commissioner of Egypt, the head guy there. And God is not sending an ordinary corporal in jail or constable in jail or sergeant in jail. God is sending the commissioner of angels to go down to speak to Daniel. And 500 years later, he's sending the same commissioner to speak to John, to, 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 to Zachariah and to speak to Joseph. Personally, when I look at that interaction of the angel Gabriel with John the Baptist and with Joseph, it tells me that the message that was sent was of the highest order and urgency. Number two, the persons that were recipients of that message was very, very significant, very significant, and they will be playing a very important role in what Jesus Christ has to accomplish, what is part of his plan. And in that case, we're looking at the redemption plan of man. And we see here that that, that message from Gabriel to Mary and Joseph, that, 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 that message to Zachariah, we look at the nature of the message, we could see the importance of that message. We could see, we could see that that was wrapped in specialty, highest priority, highest order to deliver such a person. The task that he was going to do was, in, was very significant based on who was sent to deliver the message. So based upon that, we begin to get a sense that this guy, he was pre-selected for something very, very great. And we begin to understand that from the inception, his ministry would not be so much about the physical liberation. His ministry wouldn't be so much about leading people to a physical canaan. His ministry would not be so much about providing water for people in a desert, providing water and giving them manna that they would feel and eat. His ministry wasn't so much about that. But his ministry was more in the spiritual realm. And I'll tell you that as great as Moses was, John the Baptist did the exact things that Moses did. The exact thing that Moses did. But he did it in a different realm. He did it in the spiritual realm. Even down to where they operated. Moses operated in the desert. John the Baptist, we saw him first being introduced, preaching in the desert. We see a lot of similarities between them. We see Moses gave them bread that they would eat. And they would eat the next day, and they would thirst, they would, they, would, they would still hunger. But John the Baptist presented to them bread. But they would eat that bread, and they would hunger no more. Moses gave them water in the desert. They drank. Next day they would get thirsty, and they would drink again, and they would drink again. But John the Baptist presented them with water, and they would drink. And they would thirst no more. We associate John the, ba um, John the Baptist with the first to establish baptism. But Moses did baptize too. When Moses took them through the water, through the, through the, through the Red Sea, the Bible says they were baptized. But if you compare the baptism of Moses and the baptism of John, it did not have <laughs> it did not have that 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 eternal um, or it didn't have that 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 um, in other words, it couldn't stand in and of itself. 
they could not. And very likely too, they would still have to do it a second time because we saw when they moved through the desert and they and 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 they they they, they messed up God on the on the borders of 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 entering into the land. God tell them take off your clothes, wash your wash 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 your clothes, clean up yourself. When they passed through the water, they were baptized again the second time. But we see John, John is engaging in baptism. And we and we see we see John is doing something. And it really was not the first time that that um that the baptism was being done. You know, the 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 whole idea of washing yourself that has been throughout throughout the throughout throughout um the history of Israel, God commanding them that if you touch this or if you, you know, you'd have to wash yourself, you know. So God had introduced it in a very, it's in a very subtle way, the whole idea of baptism. It could not be expanded further because they were under the dispensation of the law. The blood of bulls and the blood of calves was, was, was the means by which their sins were forgiven. But here in the New Testament, you see, John is doing something. John is doing something that is really, really, I mean, revolutionary. It's new. And, and, and John is calling sinners to repentance. His mission as a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was coming to deal with the sin problem. And there's a method that he was dealing with it, and he, he's calling sinners to repentance. And then he baptized, he baptized them for the remission of their sins. That's the work of John the Baptist. Now, when you look at when you look at what he is doing, and again I say their their work was one was physical, the other was spiritual. One led to a physical Canaan, but John's work led to the spiritual Canaan. And so Looking at the two, by virtue of their mission, you see Moses' Moses' mission, Moses' work impacted a group of people at a particular time, and that's about it. But John the Baptist's work would have impacted not only his generation, but his the generations down, generations down. And he's doing, he's introducing baptism, but he's doing something here that is that is. That is just mind-boggling. In chapter 3, verse 13, it reads, Then come Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, unto Jordan, unto John, to be baptized. Jesus Christ. And what catches, what catches us here? Again, we're dealing with John the Baptist here. And what he accomplished, what he, what his work was, how far-reaching his work was, as opposed to the finite nature of of the work of Moses. This is verse, verse fourteen. John re, John reacts to this this idea of Jesus after asking him to 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 be baptized, and 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 he he responds by saying, and Jesus answering and said unto him, suffer it to be so suffer it to be so now and here is the part that is really interesting for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness us to fulfill all righteousness John is doing something together with Jesus. Not that the act of John has merit to it, but John is going to do something that no humans would have an opportunity to do. Unique. One person would have ever done that. Is to baptize the Lord, the Son of God. And this, <laughs> the thief on the cross, later on, would rejoice 
in what John the Baptist. It had it this act would impact every single human being on the planet. Because when John baptized him, we were in him. And so the action of while Moses did stuff that impacted a, uh, just, uh, just a group, a small group of people. You see, the actions of John the Baptist, the impact he's having, not only on the Jews in that time or, or in the areas of the Jordan, but that would have impacted the entirety of the human race. And so, when you look at, when you look at further how important his, 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 life, his life was as a forerunner and how his ministry, he started off his, his ministry, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus came on the scene, Jesus did not, he didn't change anything. When Jesus started his ministry, the first thing Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Their lives were both sh very short. Very, very short. Uh, at best, I, I couldn't get conclusive numbers on that, but at best, John the Baptist lived anywhere from about maybe 30 to 32 years old. Jesus Christ lived around that same amount of time. Their life was both cut short. John the Baptist dies at the hands of of um, Herod of Antipas, and when we when we look at that, look at the death, Jesus, where the incident, Jesus flees that area. Jesus flees that area. But in as much as you, the, that, that death of John the Baptist, we look at it, as terrible as it was, as horrible as it was, I see it as a solid, solid source of strength and encouragement for, for Jesus. Jesus understood that he too, he too would have walked that very, very same same path of John the Baptist. And so I think more than anything else, he was strengthened significantly by the death of John the Baptist. It strengthened him to keep in focus the mission at hand. Forces of darkness coming up against the forces of good. And it appears that the forces of darkness is winning. It appears that. This is the only fight. <laughs> this is the only fight that you will see where death is victory. There's no other fight. <laughs> There's no other fight you can think of where the captain of the host dies and that brings about victory. But in the case of Jesus, it does. And so we see John, John, John losing the fight physically. But John was a winner. John was a hero. And so looking at him, John's John's um John's 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 work, if you compare him to, to, to Moses, you see quite a bit of similarity, but John did not function in the physical realm. John, John work, it pertained to the kingdom of heaven. And by so doing, it impacted. All of us. And so for, I think through those lens, looking at it through those lens, we can conclude that he's... Hold one second. Yeah. yeah. One second, eh, please, guys. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry about that. Yes. Yes. So oh, I got <laughs> I got a little distracted. Yeah, so yeah, looking at looking at um looking at his work on the on the spiritual realm, not on the physical, I think that qualified him because what he did, what John did impacted 
impacted just about everybody. Every All the souls that would come to know the Lord. His, um, John, John's ministry impacted them in some way. Now, that said, we are going to continue on where we left out on verse 17. By the way, any any comments, any comments here, any any thoughts, any comments before we we continue from last week? Are you still sleeping or what? No, we're wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I I will I will I will assume that um there's no comments. All right, so let's let's move on to let's move on to uh, Matthew chapter four. But just before we move to chapter four, let us just take back verse seventeen again. Um, and actually, 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 um, sixteen. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God declaring Jesus Christ is his Son. It's very, very interesting. Lord, voice from heaven, I guess... I don't know how many people heard it, but if I, I I I don't think it was it was selective. Maybe just for a few people. I think probably there are instances that God did things among um among people, and um, just a selected few would see it or understand it. But in a situation like that, uh, lots of people coming in and all. It's a busy area, massive. Crusade effort is going on, baptism and all of that good stuff. I think God chose an appropriate time to to make known or to declare His Son. That is very very important as well because um, His ministry, a big portion of His ministry, He would be He would be He would be really dealing with that issue as to whether or not He was the He was the true Son of God. You know? And so God declares that, and we see towards the end of his ministry, on the Mount Transfiguration, God declares that as well. I think in an effort to say, son, job well done. Chapter 4 starts, Then was Jesus led up off the, off, sorry, then was Jesus led up off the, the off, the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards and hungered. And when he, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be. Bread. Let's go back again to something I find very interesting. Jesus Christ, he is baptized, he goes into the wilderness, he fasts. He goes to fast, and at his weakest moment, God presents him to be tempted by the devil. As I look, I look, I look at, I look at this. And I'm reading it as it says, God allowed the devil to tempt him, or the Spirit led him in that area to be tempted of the Lord. It caused me to look at it caused me to look at Luke chapter eleven. Can you put that up, please? Verses from verses two to eleven. Luke chapter eleven, verses two Just to before eleven. Just if I do so, yes, um, I I see the challenge you had in reading verse one from the King James version. The oven, oven, oven had you a little tongue tied. If you only read it from a modern version, to say then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> it makes it makes easier reading. Uh, it's easier reading. And I realize the of the of seem to uh, off. Um, anyway, want what? Look what? <laughs> Look chapter eleven two to four. And, and, and that says, so he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the part I'm looking for here is, uh, let's go to four. And forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When you look at the, the prayer, when you look at the prayer that Jesus is teaching his disciples, and you, you look at what Jesus, <laughs> what, what the Spirit is doing to, to Jesus, he is He's leading him to be tempted by the devil. Uh, the question here to, to the class here is, um, is, that, is that part of our experience here? Is that, is that part of our reality? Is that part of, our, of the human experience the same way Jesus was led? Do we, are we often tempted? Because I, when I read the Old Testament, I see many examples of that. Jesus Christ said, um, I will do. I will allow that to remain so that you can be tempted. Uh, you know, I, I, I see several um, examples of that. But in our day here, are we having the same experiences? Are we being tempted of God? And if we are tempted, what is the purpose? What's the what's the intent? What's the objective of of that? I see my other hand raised. Yeah, um, my hand is raised for the understanding of this one. Because when I read that on the surface, it makes me think that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for that purpose, so that he could have been tempted of the devil. But I do not think that is what the scripture wants to tell us there. Um, it could also mean that the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness and there he was tempted by the devil. So which one do we go with? <laughs> the question I, that came I to... think he was... Oh, sorry. The question that came to mind is, uh, who is the spirit? Who is leading Jesus into the wilderness? Sometimes we read that and we think we, we, see, we see some other force. We see some other being, some other person leading Jesus. And I, I know it's easy, you know, for us to think that way because of our or our previous orientation but the spirit is not another entity another per another person another being leading jesus jesus has the spirit of god in him and the spirit of god the presence of god the mind of god is guiding him he's responding to the father's wish he's responding to the father's wish for him the father's a purpose for him and following the father's command to go and face those temptations for a very special purpose. I yield. Okay. But figure you so, Sonia was Sonia was saying. Yeah, but figure you still left us. You still left us a little hanging. In terms we got of... Manila's question? Yes, it because we would like okay, a little maybe, more clarity. Maybe I didn't make it clear. Maybe I didn't make yeah. it clear that I, the father's purpose I, for him was to be tempted by the devil. Maybe I didn't make that clear enough. No, no, no. You, no, you, you, you did say something that is very clear here. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is 
pretty understood that who was leading who was leading that operation the father yes sonia sonia uh, i was going to say similar that it was god who led him into the into the into the into the wilderness to be tempted um but sometimes like in the beginning in the past i used to when i read that i will go over to this other scripture will come to mind where it says god doesn't tempt or cannot be tempted and would sometime mix it up and thinking okay wait but god wouldn't tempt him cuz god cannot be tempted um you know jesus shouldn't be able to be tempted but in the minds in the mindset of the humanistic nature that he was in he was able to be tempted and so basically i'm just saying that i believe god allowed him to go in there to be tempted but it wasn't tempted cuz god don't tempt you to do evil so it was the devil he was being tempted by so in this sense in verse 1 he wasn't being tempted by god or by the holy spirit it was by the devil and i think sometimes i get mixed up the understanding of that all right so so you what you say is that he wasn't tempted by god but god took him into an environment that he would have been tempted by the devil that's is that yes. essentially what, what you say yeah that's my understanding to be tested or to be proved to be proved all right yeah. I, like, i like the two words anybody else I like those words too. <laughs> I like those words too. Um, we read in the Old Testament. I have not compared the Hebrew and the Greek here, but we read that in those days, um, God did tempt Abraham, and um, a more appropriate word would be He tested the fidelity, the faithfulness, His commitment to to you know to follow the directions of God, and that's what I see happening here. The son of God was going to undergo a test to see how to demonstrate to us, I would say, how committed he was to doing the will of the Father. Because throughout his life, up to the cross, that's what it would be about. And so these were were tests leading up to the cross. Test his fidelity and his, his sense of purpose. I yield. Thank you for that. So, so figure I'm coming now. So in Let's Luke see. 11, Manila, you you want to say something? Question I have. Eh? Yes, please. So you yes, tell yes. me if it's appropriate. No, go ahead. Everything is appropriate here. <laughs> okay. Um, the verses that you went back to from last week, it's leading us to the start of chapter four. And um, verse 16 tells us that John saw, well, the spirit of God descending like a dove and an, an, and alighting upon him. And mm -hmm. this um, chapter four is telling us that he was led by the spirit into the wilderness. That is the same spirit of God that, that um, enlightened him. Look for one is telling us then Jesus full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Could, um, would it be appropriate to say that prior to his baptism, he did not have the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Interesting question. Very interesting question. Anybody? I, this is how I would probably look at it. Um, I think he was always filled with the Holy Spirit. I just think the spirit or the nature of the, the power of the spirit increases or intensifies depending on what is taking place or what is happening. Um, 
I, I that's how I would see it. I because say for instance, um, I believe I'm filled with the spirit, but something significant happened down the journey that that um allows you to witness or see doesn't mean I basically it's a result of him being filled with the spirit. What we're seeing there happening is the result of that's just being shown or able to be seen. But I don't think he wasn't filled with the spirit because he's been doing the will of the father from day one. And I think the only way you can do that is to be filled with the father's presence or the the, the spirit in my, in my understanding. I'm finished. I would like to contribute to that um, to that response by directing our minds to Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 15, where the angel was announcing to Zacharias the birth of John the Baptist. And it says, And he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. I don't think Jesus was any less than that. I just, I just, if you hope to see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Even from his mother's womb. The, 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 the matter of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that the, the, the mind is so completely taken over by the power and the presence of God. And Jesus had that as well. I don't think he, I'm saying he had any less of presence and power of God, controlling and directing him. But like Sonia was saying, what is being emphasized here is to help us to see what happened because of the fact that he was filled with the presence of the Father in him. It's not that at baptism, the, the, the Father filled him. We see a demonstration of, the, of that um, at his baptism. It's not that the father was not with him before or the father su suddenly came down to meet him at that time. This, this, these are picture images and demonstrations of, um, of what God did for him, you know. But um, as he said, I don't think it was any less um, of that. It's just showing that he was filled with the presence of the father. And as a result, he was able to go on his mission. Okay. Um well Sister Rosehand is up. Um, but then before, just as you read that Zechariah verse 15, to be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, that too is an a clear indication that the mm. Holy Spirit is not a third person. Yeah. I, Amen. 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 Really. On that one. Sister Rose, and was up, you said? Yes, my hand was up, but um, you more or less um, um, stated the points that I was going to um, to make because I see here Christ from his birth, well, the Bible said that it was the spirit, right, who would overshadow Mary. So from birth, even from his mother's womb, I believe he had the spirit. But certain things are there for us. It was for us or for the people at that time to understand. For example, John said that he did not know him, but he was, the one who sent him to baptize said to him that the, um, he, will see that, um, he will see the presence of God landing on him and he will know. So that was an indication to the people, to John and to the people around to identify, yes, truly this is the Son of God. Yes, this is Jesus. He also made that point on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes, this is Jesus, another sign for people to know. At the Feast of Tabernacle, yet another sign. So the sign being shown is not to say that he did not have the Spirit, but more or less for people like um in the day to really understand, yes. So the spirit, God's presence has been with him all the time. But at times it demonstrates so human beings could come to the understanding that God is the one working with him. 
So that's my point on that. <laughs> yeah, if I if I may add, in John twenty twenty two, Jesus um, said to the disciples, "Please be with you." You could hear me? Oh, yeah. He said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That was John 20, 22, when Jesus was here on earth with the disciples. Yet in Acts, these same people receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit again. So um, it's a manifestation that is given for the, a mission. Jesus was about to begin his mission, and for the for those who will be re, who will read about it, um, I just John made it visible. Just like um, on the day of Pentecost, it was made visible that people would know th this special group. This group of people are empowered to do this mission. I yield. All right. Anybody else? No, guys. In light of in light of what we see, the Spirit leading Jesus Christ to be tempted, and what Luke eleven two to four verse four is saying. In the in the Father teaching his disciples how to pray, the point that say, "Lead us not into temptation." Um, the conclusion we are drawing here is, Christ was led to be tempted. Are we? Can we make that same conclusion about us too? Uh, because the whole point we understood that it was to, it was to, it was to prove his allegiance to 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 God. It was to prove him. Uh, uh, that was that word there used by the young sister to to prove him. Are we are we here having similar experiences with with Jesus? Is it correct to say that? And and the person and the, and the one doing it is 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 the is the father. I don't think we could question the father. We cannot question the fathers, but we can't. No, no, we're not, we're not, no, we're not questioning. We're not, we're right. not questioning. We, this is a very benign question. It's, we're not questioning. We're just getting an understanding. It's an understanding we try to give yeah. here. We're not questioning him father, to say, why are you doing that or why are you not doing that? Yeah. No, that's not the intent of the question. But if the fathers will that you pass through this road where you will be tempted, um, that is the father's will. For Jesus, he had a mission. and. I don't think the father that the father led him into the wilderness and there he was tempted. I believe the father led him into the wilderness for that particular um trial where he would be tempted and proved. And he could do it to us. We can pray not to be led into temptation. We can pray for that. Mm -hmm. But is it the Father's will that we will not be tempted? We are asking him, don't lead us to be tempted. But if he desire wow. to lead us for his best outcome, wow. we can't do anything about it. Mm. And, and that's why, figure, before you come in, and that is the reason. No, no, I'm not, I'm not coming in. I'm just, wow. <laughs> That, that's the reason why I'm going, I'm, I'm hammering at this thing, because too many times, if you go somewhere in certain areas and you say the, 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 the Lord is going to tempt you, the Lord is going to do this, they might end up putting you outside. They, they'll tell you, you're, you're blasphemous, you're, you're this, you're all, all of these things. But again, here we see that if it is God's will, <laughs> if it is God's will, for you to be tried, for you to to prove your allegiance to God, um, uh, it is it is it is so be it. that is that is that is a, a an action that God did, God took. Number two, the reason why I would like I I, I wanted to dwell on it, um, 
is most of us we have not approached the subject head on like this. We have we have always blamed another another being another. We have always blamed, but we need to understand that whatever we go in through, whatever how are we te- how in whatever sh- shape or form we are tested, it is the will of God for us. And that is what, and it's number one. Number two, when Jesus passed the test, it is an opportunity for us to glorify God through, regardless of the circumstance, but it's an opportunity to glorify God. Paul speaks about spectacles before God and before angels. We have to shine before God in that respect. Anybody? Yeah, my hand um, was raised. I guess y'all didn't see it. Um, just listening to what you're saying, how do we equalize or balance off or offset that with um James, James 1, 13 and 14? Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Um, the, there, are two things, there are two things that we need. God did not tempt Christ. He That's tempted right. him to, tempt, to be tempted. That's right. It does not tempt us. It doesn't tempt us. us to temptation. <laughs> and that is the difference. If you are exposed to temptation, it does mm. not mean God tempt you. Mm. Right? He tried you. Secondly. And sorry, right? and if you're tried, yeah. that doesn't mean you're tempted. You are tempted, but not by God. Tem- tem- right. Isn't temptation when you actually... Is it when you when it is presented before you or it is when you actually consider? No, no, no not consider. <laughs> when it is presented right. before you. Presented. When you when, when you are when you are in a position to make a decision to go this trial. way or that way. For example, in, in um Christians, you can be you can be tempted. Let me use more that everybody. Worship. The, 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 the early Christians had a choice. They were tempted to either worship Caesar or be killed. Stay true to the one God. They didn't put themselves in that position. That is something that happened. They, if they worship Caesar, they give up on God. And if they give up on if they cling to God, they are, their lives are threatened. They can be killed. That's a temptation there. You got to you got to balance eternity with um temporal life, and that is the extreme. But sometimes it's simple things like food and friends and simple things. Where to go and what to do, simple things, but. The thing is, you got to make a choice when you are placed in a position to make a choice between good and evil. You are tempted. I want to look at. I want John. It is John First John two sixteen, and my question would be, why was Christ tempted? Why was Christ, why was it necessary? For Christ to be tempted in the background of first John 2 16. For all that is in the world is the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eye, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Can you repeat your question? Why was it necessary that 
Christ was tempted with those three, I, I'll modify it, with those three particular temptations. Can you can you pull it up again, please, Finger? The first to read it again. First John two sixteen. Okay. First John two sixteen. Hmm. Let's take you. Let's take you right back to to the fall. Mm -hmm. Let's take you right, right back to the Eve situation. Yes. You lost know, the, go ahead. The food. Lost of the, and, lost of the, lost of, lost oh, of, sorry. I don't even think there's a food component to it, but lost of the eye, you see it and you desire it. You desire it. Yeah. And um, the pride of life, you will be like God. So all the all the elements of the of the of what we saw brought about the fall, brought about the fall in Eden, we see it showing up in that verse. Uh, yeah, yes, anybody? You know that um, Paul said that he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet he did not sin. Was he ever tempted with fornication? Was he ever tempted with stealing? Of course. There are, there are individual things that that um we could point out and say, well, he would never he was never tempted to be a to be a rum drinker, to be a drunkard. But all the temptations that you could think of fall under one of these three categories. And by overcoming these three categories of temptation, he have overcame. He overcame all the temptations that can ever that a human being can ever face. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, yeah, the experience is the Thank experience. You. Yes, but his experience was more intense because he was. Yeah. He had the power. He had the power to just mm. <laughs> to just destroy the tempter. Correct. And for for yeah, Sonia's right. benefit, especially since um, she was not there with us earlier in the series, there is a study of um, the Essential Knowledge series, study number sixteen. I put it in the chat: the temptations of Jesus and ours. And um, it pretty much looks into those um, three points. We are tempted in the same areas. Loss of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Adam and Eve, same three areas. Jesus, same three areas. Yeah, you'll find it helpful. Thank you. And, and just, to, just to expand on that in our own, in our own life, um, the devil is not going to waste his time to tempt me with, with, with cocaine or marijuana. And I, I, I am not drawn away from that loss. Um, neither to go and rob the bank. But one of my weaknesses, you, what, one, you neither will he tempt me to be to go and sleep with a man. I have no weakness in that area, no desire in that area. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me your weakness. <laughs> but he might tip me for a nice young lady. <laughs> ah. <laughs> all right. So, um, and all that goes for all of us. We we will not be we will not be love. tempted in every thing. But there are things that fall under the category of pride of life that we will fall for. Yeah. Because as a man read, every man is tempted when he's drawn, is tempted when he got my own loss or what, mm -hmm. he, yeah. what he desire after. So mm -hmm. in whatever you desire, if you desire for riches, he will get that to you. No matter you live St. Lucia 
and you go to America, that's going to follow you. That's your that's your template. Have you ever seen people who was working in the bank? You are muted. Tell us when you are muted. I think we lost a sound. Probably the signal. Yeah. Um, well, Sonia Han was raised before mine. I'll come in after. Um, I was just going to ask, um, since Christ was tested on all those points and he overcame, can we claim that for ourselves through Christ? Or are we supposed to still try to overcome these things? Very good question, Sonia. Very good question. And I'm not implementing doing as you will, or as people like to think. You, or That means we're free to do whatever we want. That's not what I'm implementing. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to understand how we to accept what was done we for are, us, or understand we what was done for us. Excellent question. I think... I think we should over we we should accept his but we ourselves you can't say that Christ over um overcame idolatry and so you can practice it. <laughs> no, you have to overcome it as well. Christ overcame it, but you must not. You can't go and worship idols and say, "Well, Christ overcame it for me." You must live like that overcomer that Christ did for you. As as much as it is in your power to do so. So how how does that manifest still? In? How does that? Because that, and that that again has been one of the challenges in the understanding. What about when Jesus Christ did it for you? He, I mean, he. How does that work? Christ um, is not my life. I'm living. I'm in, I am in Christ. So how 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 does that manifest? Because I'm, I'm, I'm really you. You saying you because I shouldn't. If I'm in Christ, why should I be feeling? Why should I have that temptation? Why should I be? Why should I have that that challenge? Because I am in Him. Why? Yeah, because because this mortal has not put on immortality. Neither have this corruptible put on incorruption as yet. Paul says that which I want to do. The good I want to do, I find it hard to do, but it is not I that overcome, it is Christ that overcome. So in his mind, and as far as he is empowered to, he does all he could to overcome. His heart is to overcome, but the flesh is weak. So the flesh may fail, but the mind is fixed in Christ. I don't so, know if I explained it the way it should be. Okay, so, so, so okay, so so there is a conscious effort still in on your part. There's a conscious on effort on your part. It's a real trial you're facing. It's something that is going to you you gonna it's a decision that you'll have to make. It's gonna require some sort some sort of strength, some sort of Call it willpower, whatever, whatever it is. I, I, I you know, but it's gonna require something on your part. That right. It calls for that conscious effort from you. You must make the decision, even though you may fall making that decision. You crumble under the way. Jesus crumbled under the cross. He fall. He fell. He had to get back up and go. We too will fall under those crosses, those decisions, under our decision to live righteous. But we have made that. We have made that. And, and sometimes, I don't want to start preaching, but when Jesus fell, there was somebody there that helped him with that cross. 
And sometimes our decision, living the Christian life becomes more difficult because we are not in that group of people that will help us live that Christian life, will help us before with carrying our cross. That when you start surrounding your yourself, your close friends, and get them in place, that they will help you. Your mind is fixed on Jesus. But sometimes you will fall. You will fall. Are so, you? therefore, then, what I'm gathering, not that I don't understand what you're saying, but I'm just in, you know, elaborating for others as well. I am to live as the overcomer or live because I can overcome these things because someone overcome them for me or, or show that they could be done, right? I must not think that I can do this in my own strength, of course. I know that I'm going to need help. But in the event, if I do slip, I don't need to torture myself and feel like I'm doomed because I slipped up. I can still turn to the one who has overcome and look for him to continue to help me to overcome. Yeah. And uh, don't take away from the fact that Paul says it is the flesh. It is this flesh. flesh. Mm -hmm. It is this it is this mortal, this this mortal thing in me. This nature. Brings a question: that Is, is that me. the thorn in the flesh? No, I don't think okay. so. Okay, no. all right, just check it. All right. Right. So right. when people are advocating, advocating becoming perfect, perfect, mm -hmm. that is not a reality. When you are okay. in mortal, no, mortal reality. Gotcha. It is when this mortal shall put on immortality, immortal. shall put on in corruption, that then we shall be, we shall have the power to live a fully righteous life without, I mean, we don't, we will not fall. But as until that time, the flesh is going to keep throwing you down. And that is why okay. Satan tempted Jesus. Satan tempted Jesus because he knew in this flesh, he yeah, in this flesh, oh, he 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 he, he exposes himself. Mm -hmm. You can't. So that's divinity. why it's powerful. You cannot, it's powerful. You, you, you can't overcome divinity, but you can overcome the flesh. Got you, and it's powerful to have the mind of Christ. Yeah. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. That's the mind, but the flesh, uh, that's something else. <laughs> that's something else. <laughs> can I break up? Can I break up the dialogue a little bit? Go ahead, do so quick, eh, because and, I and, come and, in. No, and <laughs> go back so to quick. the go back to the no go back to the traffic light because sometimes you have to direct traffic. <laughs> Manila's hand has been raised for quite a while, and um, okay, those whose hands were not raised were coming ahead of her, so I wanted her to go. Um, so go ahead, Manela. Thank you, director, or should I say husband? Um <laughs> I, I'm satisfied with the response that you gave to the question that I'd ask based on James 1. However, I think you've only concentrated on verse 13. I am still waiting for the answer as it relates to verse 14, because here is Jesus, a man without sin. Here is Jesus, and Sterling showed us in John. What does the three, say? Um, just now, um, the three, Sterling showed us the three categories under which he was tempted. Mm -hmm. But he's been led by the spirit to be tempted the, um, um, of Satan. Verse 14 of James 1 says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And that is not what I'm seeing in Christ. So how do we compare those two? Um, please read 15 as well. Read from 13 to 15 to get the context of James. I knew you'd say context, you know. <laughs> so it goes. And otherwise. <laughs> Um, 
I'm actually from 12. 12 would be in and answer your question. I need to go back to it to get all those gems. One from gems 12. one is it? It's one. Bless, okay. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. temptation. For when he has been approved. What's that? Go ahead. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Mm. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. I understand that. But mm -hmm. each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Mm -hmm. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Can I say a word on that? <laughs> um, we, Because of the nature we inherited from Adam, each of us were born with sinful desires. Mm -hmm. Bible speaks mm -hmm. about our carnal mind. That carnal mind has to be redeemed, has to be reformed. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't have a carnal mind, right? And so he was not, he was not of himself desiring, wanting, <laughs> wanting to worship the devil. Mm -hmm. The devil had to present himself to him or present those temptations to him. Unlike us, all our nature drives us in that direction. It pulls mm -hmm. us towards doing wrong. <laughs> and so that's 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 the difference when it comes to Jesus' temptations and ours. But like him, we're not tempted by God. We put in situations, or situations confront us where our desires draw um draw us into temptation not sure that helps man ever my only thing is that jesus did not have his own desires yet he was tempted because i look that, at that as a category um as a qualifying factor for temptation and jesus does not fall under that category yet he, he was tempted right that's why he had to be put in a position where the devil, to be tempted by the devil. The devil had to present those temptations, present those desires before him. To see if Adam didn't have evil desires either. Right? Adam didn't have evil desires. They had, they had to be brought to him. He had to be enticed by them from the outside. I, I have those desires in my flesh. I so 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 mm -hmm. um so I take it in the sense of um the, the situation with Jesus he had to um he had to go through it just um in order to complete the mission the, the mission or maybe to set the example for us for learning admonition or whatever that, that that's how I see it. but we with us like um Pastor Vega said we have a natural tendency to be joined to our own lust and our own thing temptation and whatnot because of that carnal nature of sin and that sinful nature. But since Jesus didn't have it, um his his was he was taken there to be tempted just to 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 complete the mission, I would say. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that he had to go through that, that that experience, I would say. Yeah. Good summary, good summary. Claude, we are still waiting on our our guests. Um he said he would be here. And some of those guys have to drive from church for miles, so I'm not sure um, what time he will show up. So I guess we just have to continue still. But I want to just touch on something that um, that Stalin mentioned. Let me take a put my hand. Yes, Stalin mentioned the the matter of um, perfection and the difference between the difference between um, righteousness by faith and perfectionism is that. Perfectionism, in perfectionism, the outcome 
or the result depends on your overcoming. If you don't overcome everyone, you cannot be victorious. Righteousness by faith claims the victory even while you are in undergoing the temptation. And like Solon Stilling said, you will fall sometimes, you'll make mistakes, you'll err. God judges you as an overcomer in Christ. Perfectionism is different. You have to, have to pass that in order for you to become an overcomer. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I made that clear. The perfection part, we got it. That we, 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 I get the perfection part. That that perfection is in Christ. Right? That part of it. But to, when you have to unite the two ideas <clears throat> of of the temptation and the possibility of falling, um, those two have to be kind of skillfully weaved together. Because, because Claude, we inherited our weaknesses from Adam who fell. We will inherit, or we are, have inherited our strength, our overcome <clears throat> position in Christ who overcame. We mm. did not fall. We did not <laughs> make Adam fall. Or we did not do anything for Adam to fall. I'm Adam fell. fell. And by his falling, we fell. all his children <laughs> fell with him. By Christ overcoming Amen. all of Adam, he's the second Adam, all Amen. of his children overcame with him. Amen. We are out of the equation. We are overcomers as long as we are in Christ. Amen. Like we were sinners as long as we were in Adam. I yield. Okay. <clears throat> um, still in your womb, you made a point there that really caught my attention um, as it related to, to Christ um, falling, Christ falling, and um, that he was carrying the cross, that, that's, that, that's burden he was carrying. And then mm -hmm. he fell, and and someone there, some 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 guy in the crowd helped him to carry that burden that he had. How how does that um, how how do we draw from that in our everyday experience in terms of um, how is that how how do you how do you define or how do you how do you explain a Simon of Siren in in your in our day to day existence? How how does he show up? How 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 does he carry that cross? How does he help shift the burden to some degree in our everyday experience? I want to say the Christian life. The Christian does not make it to heaven on his own by himself. It's a community of people moving towards the kingdom, and. We have to help one another. Too often we don't help one another. We it's for, I for me and you for you. We, and, and we get weak or we fall. When you are for you and you fall, who's there to help you? If, if I'm just for me and I fall, who's there to help me? But when we have somebody that will help us when we fall or when we are falling, we don't even have to fall. When we are falling, somebody to help us, give us an encouraging word, reach out to us, support us, encourage us on. I tell you this, sometimes this life is not easy enough. For the Christian, for the one who, be, who, who believe in God, this life is not easy. Mm -hmm. And the enemy, the enemy throws some of the, some of the most serious Assaults upon those who believe in the one true God. But if we are there for one another, for somebody it might be financial, for another it might be social, for another it might, there are all kinds of things. It might be sickness. It, it, there are all kinds of ways 
that we can fall and lose faith. The fall is to lose faith in God. That's the root of the Christ, uh, uh, of what Satan wants. He wants you to lose faith in God. If you become poor, you can become poor. You can become, you can have nothing but still have a strong faith in God. It is, that is what counts. Though whatever befalls you, your faith must be stronger. When your brothers see you losing faith or they see the, see the enemy assailing you and in that way that you can lose faith, they need to gather around and help you, encourage you. And don't assume because a man or woman is smart walking and smiling and talking cheerful that they are not being tempted, that they are not being, the cross is not getting heavy on their backs. <laughs> wow. Some of the heaviest crosses Even... you know, is on people who, feel, who carry a smile on their face. To them, it's a grin, a grin, but to you, it's a smile. And you got to know the difference. That person needs your help. They need your support. They need a word of encouragement. They need a prayer. They need your love. And that is lacking. That is why Jesus, that, that, that command by Jesus in John 14 is so important. As I have loved you, I want you to love one another. And that love is a love, that love is an action word. Here for one another. Know when to support and when to help and when to, and what to do. So yes, Jesus fell and Simon of Cyrene was there. Although it was forced upon him, he carried it without granting. Who is there to carry your, help you carry your cross when you fall? Are you? Thank you. Well done. Well done. Anybody else um, before we move on? Right, so we will we will on verse verse four. Let's continue on verse four. It says, "But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.'" I think we were a little we were a little cut off a little bit. Let's get some. Let's look at the what led to that res response and and the ten and when the tempter came to him, he said, "If thou shalt, if thou be the son of God, command you that these me. stones." You could just start with that question with, with that part. <laughs> if thou be the son of God, <laughs> oh. thou be the son of God. Command these stones to be made into bread. Wow. That's the so temptation. So Harry Clayton saying that Fury Christ said. is indeed. He was in heaven, you know. He knows that Christ is indeed the son of God. Yet, Christ is presented to us on earth. And some are still battling that Christ is not the literal Son of God. Mercy. You know that Christ had heard that just <clears throat> excuse me, just 40 days before, just 40 days before this coming, mm. Christ you heard my, a voice from heaven. My son. Yes. <laughs> Just forty days percent. before, Jesus, when 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 Adam was created, he was created. Into, you are the Son of God. You are like God. As a matter of fact, the the, the scriptures say that God create. Let us create man in our image. That means man was like God. In the image of God, Satan say. To Eve, you shall be like God. He, 
speak this through your IB when you shot. He man was already like God. Then Satan tempted him to be like God. Now he is saying to Christ, if you are the Son of God, knowing full well that he is the Son of God, because he probably would have heard that same voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. And the, 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 the thing about it, the sad thing about it is now that most of the Christian world don't understand this statement. If you are the son of God, they, 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 they don't believe Jesus is the son of God. They say, this is God playing the role of a son. This is a metaphor. Some tell you he's Jesus the son the only son. as a human. Only as a... This is the condemnation of Christianity today. If you are the son of God. That, just that, just that, that phrase. If you are the son of God. But still, man, still, you have to look. Look at look at the condition. He 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 fa he fasted for forty days. And when you look at the fasting for forty days, um, he's fire. A lot of people attempt. A lot of people fast three days, five days, twenty, twenty-one days, forty days. A lot of people do that, and some people do it with. <laughs> With water, uh, some people do it with limited amount of sugar, uh, maybe veggie. But the strict, the stricter ones, maybe just just plain water, no no food and of sorts. And, and after forty days, you need to understand the the ship of the of the human body at that particular point. Also mentally, you also you also have to. To take into account the, his mental state at <laughs> at that particular point, um, it's uh, doing a fast this strict without without no carbs, with just without any water, without without no food. Uh, the the human body is not is not in a very very good position. It's not. Um, and and mentally too, you you you're not quite there. Um, you may hallucinate. You might. I mean, the, the lack of, of 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 sugar in your system to to supply your neurons for good brain functioning is 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 depleted. So your your state of mind is not in the best of. It's it's, it's not in the best of um, state, and so it can be. But your mind after fasting, um, unless you're sick or so, but you you should fast for your mind should be more alert to me. It should it sh it should be, but your your mind should be. But what I'm saying is that the impact it have on you physically, on your physical body, yeah, on your physical body, you you may, it the physical may overrun your your mental. Up to a certain point, you get good mental clarity. I'm, I'm that's right. No, that's right. No, no, no that's question right. That's about five that. Days, you know? That's not five days. <laughs> <laughs> you have good mental clarity, but <laughs> but when that your your system itself start to 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 weaken by the lack of food, by the lack of water, the impact it having on your on on your brain function, you are in a very very vulnerable position, and. That's why we look at we, when we look at this the issue of um, we we have a tendency probably to just laugh at oh, that's not, that's nothing for Jesus I mean what food <laughs> you we you kind of make light of of the fact that he he resisted the food or that was probably nothing but you need to understand it from the standpoint of where Jesus was he was not really physically he was not in a in the, in the best of position and you know. 
with with that, I mean, people do all sorts of stuff when they're hungry, when they're thirsty. You know, you could do anything. I mean, you've seen, you've seen, we, we've, we've seen it. You know, so so coming from that standpoint, uh, Jesus had to be strengthened. His re, his his reliance, his his dependence had to be one hundred percent on 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 the Father for for strength. And the message, the message, um, the message it, it teaches here is is is, is one of. It's, it's, it's one of being one with, with God in, in situations like that. Total dependence on God. Uh, that is not an exercise. That that exercise is, is is one that I don't know how many people could accomplish it uh, because a lot of people do it with, you know, some people, I attempted it, I did it already, but I drink um, coconut water. I didn't eat food. <clears throat> I did it, but but it's, it's nothing in comparison to to not Depriving your body from with water and sugar and things of that nature. It's a completely different experience. So we're looking at his response. To look at his response, there it's it's it's, it's yeah, huge. But, but Claude, I even even before that, I do not see although no, I do see that thing with food. But in this first temptation, what I what stands out most to me, that is to me, is the questionship of the sonship of God. Amen. <laughs> if you are the ah, son of God, that's right. He's putting Jesus in a position to he's questioning Jesus' sonship. Mm -hmm. You have to prove to me that you are the son of God by doing this. I you. The, the, yeah. the nature of that temptation, I mean, Sterling, we often miss it. It is not Jesus turning stones to bread. He could do that so very easily. And what would be wrong, just think about it, what would be wrong in the action of turning stones to bread to satisfy his hunger what would be wrong in a in him just snapping his finger and a tree a fig tree appearing before him laden with figs he is the creator or we could say the world was created through him he was able we saw it to take a couple of fish bread and feed thousands of people he told peter Throw your net there. You'll catch a fish. It has some money in its mouth. Where did the money come from? <laughs> the temptation was not for Jesus to feed himself. It was for him to presume on the fact that the father called him his son. And that would have instilled doubt in his mind. He would respond to the devil's um, temptation regarding his... Um, Sonship. Question of his sonship. That that was that was at stake. His sonship. Yeah. I yield. Yes, yes, and yes, that, uh, definitely. And and we saw again, that, and the devil was not successful this time around. But we see how he used the Jews to question to 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 to, to further challenge Jesus with 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 that same question you know um by placing doubt that no son of son of joseph isn't he the isn't he is you know that sort of stuff so it didn't end it didn't end there uh he continued going after him um questioning that but i think out of the fasting experience i think he was he was in a much better position to to deal with that anyway any any comments before we go to hand raised. yes mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as I listened to you all saying that the question was indeed to prove that he was the son of God. And here we have Christ choosing not to prove that he is the son of God. So um, Christ undertake, I'm not undertaking that mission. Why is it now our mission to prove to others that Christ is indeed the son of God?
our mission is different to Christ's mission. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. It's, our mission is to present Christ as the <laughs> Son of God. <laughs> Does that satisfy you, Manila? I don't even know, Claude. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? What you? What you? What you know? Yeah, I understand, Maybe. Manila, because we assume that I understand with Manila because, for, for, you know, in as much as I cannot answer it yet, for sure, but that answer is loaded. You know, I mean, it's really, it is this, it's deep, it's deep. You know, yeah, why still in? Maybe the answer, maybe. Crisis answer may answer you, may, may satisfy you fully, uh, Manella. In verse 4, he says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan tempted Christ. Prove who you are by turning stones into bread. Christ is telling Satan, Me turning stones into bread, and I'll prove who I am. Who I am is by the word of God. What was the word of God 40 days before? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That was that was what made him his son. The word of God. That's what strengthened Christ. That's what gave Christ the assurance. That was I the assuring words. It is written, man shall not live. If I turn these stones into bread, how is that going to help? Who I, who I am, because the question is if thou art the son of God. If I turn these stones into bread, will, will Moses turn the rod into um into a snake? Moses threw down his rod and it turned to snakes and Pharaoh's servants throw down their rod and they turn into snakes too. All two were snakes. So it does not mean, but the word of God, God himself proclaimed Christ to be the son of God. Don't miss this in this first commandment. In this first temptation, sorry, it was Christ's word. It was God's word versus Christ's action. Prove that you are the son of God by turning this. And Christ is saying, no, I know I'm the son of God because I heard his word declare me to be his son. Ail. Yes, and I think when when it was declared, um, when it was declared that when the Father declared the Son as being the Son of God, I know the devil had employees on the scene. They heard, and not only that, beyond that, they knew they knew him from from before. So 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 it is basically it, it's it's I think there's it, a lot of mind games going on here. Um, um, kind of looking at his his, his, his state of vulnerability and um, and playing on that, and he does that to us a lot. Um, um, you might end up doing something silly because you're in a situation that you you, you have a need. Uh, your, your kid can't you can't pay your kid's tuition, or you can't provide this, or this is coming on you, and you resort to. You resort to making a decision that is um, that is not quite reflecting that you're a child of the Most High God, you know. So it it, it plays out in, in in it plays out, but but as as um, the response the response that that Jesus gave to the devil, uh, I think we have that we have that too. Um, some people might argue, well, they've tried it and it did not work. I really don't know what to, what to what to say, but um, I think the same power, the same access that Jesus had in situations like that, I think um, we have it as well. So, uh, any comment? Yes. Yeah. You see, we we need to bring the, these things home. We go for a job interview. We go for a job interview. We are probably the most qualified. Some people will say some of us are overqualified. And yet somebody from somebody else got the job ahead of us. But we are children of the most high high God. How did they get that job? That was sitting and putting your mind. 
why the true star person before you if you are son of the most high God? Does that job define you, define who you are? Getting that job or not getting that job, does that make you not the son of God? Does that take away from you being the son of the most high God? Or a son of the most high God? And, and a lot of times we, 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 we define ourselves by what God does for us. Um, what he give us, he give us a job, he give us a house, he give us good health, and that's how we define ourselves. But as soon as we lose them, we 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 turn our backs on him and we give up on him. We forget that he has already declared us to be his sons. Whether you lose your job or not, you are still a son of God. Whether you go through sickness or not, you are still a son of God. Don't let your condition, your mortal condition now, defines who you are in Christ. And that is what Satan was, this whole first temptation was that. Trying to make Jesus define himself by what he was able to do, by the condition that he was in. When he had already listened to the Father declaring him, he would have heard his mother's story about him. He would have seen John the Baptist and heard John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. Yet now he's faced with this. And Satan wants to define him by what he can do by, for himself. And we are we, we face that every day. Every day we face that we are not to be defined that way. If Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, you are a son of God. Are you? I like I like the song. I like the sound of that. I like the sound of that. I tend to think that there was a lot more going on. On the scene of that temptation, yep, that that's that's not recorded, um, Sterling. Yep. Oh yes. Because look, look, you who have access to all that there is around your father, you claim to be the father, sorry, son of the Most High God, and you are here hungry. How in the world could that be? How could you be hungry? Not just hungry, you know. Your body is weakened from lack of food. You are not hungry, but starving from food. The Son of God should not starve. The temptation he puts in, your, in, in the mind of Jesus is the Son of God should not starve. And it comes to us, as you say, you know, and I, I you, you, when you mentioned about the job, I'm, I'm saying the devil, somebody, you know, whispers to you, you know why she got the job? She joined the lodge. <laughs> that's that's re that's really, you know, that's everyday thing. Oh, yeah. You know, you could join the lodge too, and you will get a job. And that that is a real temptation. And the, the Lord wants to remind you, hey, as Astalin said, you are a child of God. Hungry, but you are his child. You know, you're drowning in a sea of death, but you are his child. You know, what about if your cancer is incurable? You know, and everybody, every effort has been made, you know, to, 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 to pull you back from the brink of death. You dying. Would he allow his child to die? Oh man, that's the temp that's temptation. That's temptation. You have to live, Jesus said, by the word of God. Do you believe that? And can that word take you through to the very end? Are you going to hold on to it when everything else failed? 
you have to hear the voice of, of God saying, you are my child. Amen. Amen. Are Amen. You? Yes, well yeah. said. Definitely. A lot coming from these verses. So let us let's wrap up here with the let's wrap up here with verse five. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou art be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in the hands, shall, yes, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Yes, go ahead. I'm going to read that as a tree interior. And the devil take him up and the height of a pentagram telling, if you are figuratively the son of God, throw yourself down. If you're not really the son of God, you don't act in it, throw yourself down. And see if you're not an angel to take care of you. How much sense does that make? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I Look at where they are. They, they are in the, they are in the wilderness. Christ, Christ is in the wilderness. But the devil appears to him in the wilderness after forty days of fasting, and he took him. I want to see this as this is now. Um, the men walk there. The, man, the devil just, I want to say, snap his finger and they were there. They, they appeared on, on, on the highest point of the temple. The devil has power. And I don't know, Christ probably recognized him early. And understood that this was the devil, this was the enemy, the arch deceiver who had deceived Adam and Eve. And he took him on the highest point, the highest point of the temple. And guess the phrase he began his second temptation with again. If you are the son of God. Son of God. <laughs> are we serious? Are Trinitarians serious? Are those who believe that Christ is not the literal son of God serious? Twice the enemy questioned the sonship of Jesus. By beginning with, if you are questioning the sonship of Jesus, if you are the son of God, and he is linking it now to another action, prove you are the son of God by doing this. And again, I'll go back. I'll go back to what Christ God said. This is my beloved son. Satan probably tried to off track him by quoting the scriptures. If you are the son of God, prove it because he will send his angels to deliver you. Jesus didn't need to prove anything. He had already listened to the father declaring him to be his son. Again, he is going to, he's going to, Lean on that. You don't have to prove anything to the devil. One of the things we Christians need to know, we don't have to 
prove to the enemy that we are believers. We just got to live the life of a believer. Just keep holding on to Jesus. You don't have to prove. You don't have to do any. You don't have to go and throw yourself over no cliff. Believing that God will deliver you because you believe in him. Thank you. So, so, so then, so then, um, when I, I would say that the, you don't have to prove anything. There's something come to my mind. There. It's just like this. So the children had to um, 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 compromise the fact that um, they had to believe in the Trinity. If not, they they will, to, they will look at as a cult. So um, the church had to just stand up and say they had nothing to prove. They didn't have to bend down and, you know, accept that Trinitarian thing. There. If not, they would be considered a cult, you know. So the, the devil have different ways and methods of, you know, the routine our thing, like when we don't know where we stand, when we don't stand up strong and stand up from a hill. Uh, yes, you know, um, um, Christendom had, in the dictionary, they had defined what is a Christian. I don't know if any of you have ever checked out the definition um, that the, 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 the Episcopal Church used to define who are Christians and who are cults. To be a Christian, you must believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. To be a Christian, that's a de by definition. And you must be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you are not doing that, you are not defined as a Christian. That is why, to this day, Jehovah Witnesses are still defined as cults. Because they do not believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They believe that there is one God and that he has a son. You don't have to prove nothing to them. Jehovah's Witness didn't have to prove. Some of the Adventists used to believe that, that there's only one God. But in order, as you said correctly, in order to, to be labeled Christian, they set out to prove by changing their, their beliefs and officially accepting the doctrine of the Trinity. And they did that in, in 1980. They started the process from the 50s, but they completed it in 1980. So now they are defined as a Christian. As far as the dictionary is concerned, the Sabbath does not matter. Sabbath Sunday does not matter. As long as you believe in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you belong to the same fellowship of Catholicism, of the Catholics. And you are a Christian. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. On the Let's look at the second temptation here. Um, the, actually, the site of the second temptation. Uh, is there anything symbolic about this thing? Uh, is the is the writer trying to tell us something? Then sit of the devil. Then the devil taketh him on up onto the holy city and sit of him on a pinnacle of the temple. Is there anything symbolic about this site where he? Where he um where he's doing that temptation, that the second temptation. And I mean he could out of so many places to 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 tempt Jesus, <laughs> he goes to he goes on top of the temple. Uh that's that's I would assume that is the the temple that the second temple that was that was built by the exiles when they came from um captivity 
that place was presence of God, and here the devil no. uses no. that as the, the site. So, what does that say? Does that say anything about maybe uh, the um, what is going on in in churches in Christendom as well? Do, do we see, is it is it could we use that as context for for the kind of seeing things we see going on in Christendom in terms of the activity of the devil uh, working his his schemes in the temple environment mm -hmm. would that be something that is being expressed here and that would manifest down the line or it's just just a location he chose by accident just just haphazardly choose that location any comments on that the temple was built on a mountain that's the first thing on a hill yep so the highest point of the temple would be the highest point he can overlook the entire play all the plains and it's also a place where people would have gathered in the sight of your people god will deliver you in the sight of your people if you if you choose to throw yourself down it was the center of activity the center of commerce for jerusalem it's the center of activity people are always there people flock and come there they move there just to see that um it's a holy place, as you said. Yes, it is a holy place. If there's any place that God can deliver you, it should be at church. Mm -hmm. If he don't deliver you, if he, <laughs> I, his presence is there. His presence is there. He should deliver you there. Easier to deliver you there than to deliver you in the wilderness. But, but Selim, could we draw back from that experience, the location of the temptation, could we, could that be extrapolated back to the to the situation, the, the 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 what emerged in heaven under those conditions? I mean, this is heaven. This is the presence of God. This is the the temple was a place where God chose for His name to be called. But that I think that's Mount Moriah, um, that where He's gonna He's gonna dwell, the dwelling place of God among His people, and right. and and this becomes the site. Of 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 a temptation, and and we see if we have to 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 um go back in time, we see we see in heaven um that there was the the, the activity of the tempter, right? That's where it, it originated in a place where the temple was a place where God chose that was His dwelling place, and we see that kind of activity there, and then. So we we ask you, uh, I'm kind of asking, <laughs> was he try, was he trying to remind everybody of, hey man, I did it already, I'm I'm gonna do it again a second time, or <laughs> what's the deal here? I still try that that part to the first phrase, if you are the son of God, this is your temple. If you are the son of God, this is your temple. These are your people. Everybody you see coming belong to you, supposed to be on your side. Let your father deliver you if you are the son of God. The, the, the emphasis and the conversation must be on that part. If you are the son of God, why did he take him to the temple and ask him, if you are the son of God, and then remind him what is written? You will be delivered if you are the son of God. So, yes, we can go down many, many treads, but we cannot stray from this main issue. The temptation is to question the sonship of Jesus. Mm -hmm. His presence at the temple is to help him to question his sonship. Okay. Thank you. So, so so far, temptation. I come to you, So 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 far, temptation one and temptation two 
is pretty consistent, questioning the sonship of God so far. Mm -hmm. Manila, come in. Yeah, as you ask the question, um, um, Claude, about location, um, I look at it as, I mean, I can be wrong, but I look at it as um, a strategic part of Satan's ploy because here he is, he took him to the highest height. And um, like Sterling said, he can see far and wide. He can see all what Satan is referring to. But he took him on um, at the top of the temple. And in that temple, they would have been um, preaching the word. They would have been reading out the scrolls. And Satan now is reminding Jesus of some of the things that were taught even in the temple, in the word of, written from the word of God. You, you see? So mm -hmm. here, this church told you, you discussed on the panel and everything, the word of God said, the scroll said that no harm will, um, will, um, will come your way or um, you shall not, hit the ground you will be saved and all of that you will be rescued he's taking him to that point and telling him reminding him that it is written i think it was a strategic um, um ploy in terms of the location yeah okay anybody else and i think it's connected to the to the pride of life. The second category, the third category of, of the temptation mentioned in John. Um, the pride of life. I think it is connected to that. Overcoming that, that um, means he, he would have overcome the pride of life. All right, let's go to verse let's go to verse seven, Luke. Let's look at the the, the, the third temp, temptation. Verse seven says, Read uh, Jesus said unto him, It is written, Again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse eight, again the devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain, up the ante this time, and showeth him all the kingdom of the world and the glory of them. All the kingdom of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give to thee if thou wilt fall down and worship him. Verse 10 says, And Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hand, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. Sorry. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only That's shalt true. thou serve. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, <laughs> on, this, on the surface, I'm having a lot of problems with with, with that exchange. And, and, and Figaro alluded to that earlier on. There must be a lot more that is not documented. There's a lot more. Because I have a difficulty in... A guy taking my things and negotiating with me for for my own things. Yes, and coming back and negotiating with me. And interestingly, that is not that's not far fetched in 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 um that's not far fetched, you know, in our in our day. We see it in sometimes in everyday life. Somebody is is abducted and they they Take their money. They take the and and that that person who who adopt, uh, abducts that person that that other individual um, will negotiate with them on their. I'm going to take this. I'm going to do the. You know. I mean, in the process, if they don't take everything, but they're going to. You know, the person that person who owns that thing will probably plead with the person who abducts them for some of their belongings. It's not quite far fetched, but this is an extreme case where. Um, the devil is is actually negotiating with the Lord and telling him, "I will give you these things." Uh, when Scripture claims that um, 
everything belongs to God. Does the devil have a is he standing on solid ground here in that in that negotiation, or it is just hot air? What's the deal? Um, Rosanna, Rosanna, and then Manella. Well, my hand is is up not for to answer Claude's question, but I want to ask a question. So after Claude's question is answered, I could ask my question. Maybe, maybe you should ask it. <laughs> maybe I should. Okay. <laughs> So my question is based on verse 7, which I have been waiting for for the longest time. Okay. And uh, verse 7 reads, Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And I wanted to ask that question based on a discussion I had with a friend on the sonship of Jesus and the Trinity and um, the point I was trying to make was Jesus is the literal son of God. And he was trying to say that, no, Jesus is God. And one of the scriptures that he presented was Matthew 4, 7, to prove that Jesus is God. Jesus is not, um, Jesus is God. So Jesus here is the one and the same. Now I'm reading this verse again, and I'm looking at the word Lord, because he said, look, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, meaning that that's the same person. But I'm looking at it here now, and I'm seeing Lord, Lord here, based on what we've studied, based on what I have learned on Living Water Bible Study, the word Lord here means or is referring to God the Father. Am I right? And um, so it would read, it is written again, you shall not tempt the God, the Lord, or the God, your God. Now, is God <laughs> Satan's God? Is a, is a God to everybody, including Satan God? himself. Right. So therefore, when Jesus said to um to um Satan, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord. He was referring to the Father and not to himself, right? Permit me. <laughs> Go ahead. Permit, permit me, because she has a question on the same um verse that I was coming to comment on. Because um I was just saying for um, and that was my thoughts before um Ruru, for those Trinitarians. For those who say that God came to die for us, all of these things we're reading there in the scripture, it's actually proving otherwise. Because here, verse 7 is telling us, you sh it is written, Jesus is saying that, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And he is not referring to himself but his father, because Satan wants him to do certain things so that God can be proven, that it could be proven that he is the son of God and that his father will come to his rescue or send angels to, 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 to guard him and to protect him and um, to support that even more scripture and we saw in Moses time and previous scripture that said that God should not be put to the test. Um, however, this chapter started by God permitting Jesus to be tempted. So that simply proves to us that Jesus is, is not God in that he is not the father. We have said before, yes, the Bible says, a part of the Bible referred to Christ as God, and that means divinity. But the God here, Lord your God, means the father. And some people have the opinion that God himself died for humanity, but it is the son of God who died. And the temptation here in verse seven refers to temptation or testing of the father not of the son i yield um so where i, I thought, uh, yes 
I, I think that sometimes we, 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 a lot of people who are listening might misunderstood or might not understand clearly what Manella is saying. Satan asked Jesus to put God to the test. That's right. Thank God. That's right. Uh -huh. And Jesus is saying, you don't know that it is written that I should not, or nobody should put God to the test. We should not tempt the Lord our God. It is not that Satan is tempting the Lord his God, but he's asking Jesus to tempt the Lord his God. If you are the son of God, tempt mm. your father. Mm. Ask your father. Mm. And and if you miss that, you miss this whole second command. Mm -hmm. um, temptation. Yes, amen. We think that it, that Jesus, a lot of people understand it. And it's easy to understand it that way. That Jesus is saying, you should not tempt me. And I'm the Lord your God. But when you go on to the next temptation, you'll see who is defined as the Lord your God. And that is, but here... Jesus is saying, don't ask me to tempt the Lord my God. And that is the Father. Don't ask me to put the Father to the test. I yield. Yes. Uh, Can I? Go, go ahead. I, was, I had a slightly different spin on that. But, um, Rosanna, go ahead. Yeah, and that's the thing that when we read scripture, sometimes we take just one verse from the whole chapter and we assume that's what the chapter is saying to us and I think that's what happened to my my friend just taking that one verse and not reading the whole storyline and and I think that's what we were taught in church too by mm -hmm. looking at one particular verse and add our own understanding not going into the full context of the message so I am happy that you know, we learn things on living water that could help us, you know, be able to understand when those those um questions or present or things are presented to us, we know so that we can able to to defeat the cause or defeat maybe the response that is being given. So thank you. Amen. The way the way I looked at it still in in that exchange. <laughs> In that exchange between the devil and Jesus Christ, I, I think in that exchange that is happening, the response that Jesus Christ is giving him is telling him, do not tempt the Lord like God. And I, and I think and how I was viewing it is that Jesus Christ himself in that exchange is telling him, I am your Lord and your God as well. Nope. And if I have to use a scripture reference, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, there about the Father referencing Jesus, and to you, O God, thy throne, tell, and that's a paraphrase, your throne will be forever. Your, your throne is going to be forever. So I, I was looking at it from the standpoint of the exchange between two of them. And Jesus Christ is stopping him in his tracks. Listen, listen. He's, he, he's, he, he's divine. But I am you, you, to you, I am God. To you that knew, knew this guy, I am your God. Want it or not. So I was looking at it from that standpoint. Based upon that word was used to him, was referenced to Jesus from the Father itself in Hebrews chapter 1. That's yeah, but the title, Claude, the title Lord God refers, in the Bible, the title Lord God refers only to one single being, the Father. Jesus is called Lord, and yes, he's called God, but the title, the Lord God or the Lord your God, is only the Father. Amen. And you will come across it in the next temptation as well. And it, it's throughout the Bible, actually. He caught Peter said, Peter said in Acts 2 36, I think it is, for he have made you Lord and Christ mm -hmm. or Messiah. But not, but God has not made him Lord. Not God. God. Mm -hmm. He has not made him that. 
He had made him only Lord mm -hmm. and Messiah. Okay. I but with reference, but with reference to who Jesus Christ himself was at that particular point, uh, co couldn't, wasn't it, was it possible that no. he no. was making a statement uh, to him? No. About mm -hmm. himself? No. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meet me with the raised hand. Manila. If, <laughs> if, we, look, if we look at this entire, uh, I'm going to bring some business in that. If we look at this entire scenario, it looked like Satan wanted Jesus to enter into a contract. And for there to be a contract, there must be an offer, there must be conditions, and there must be acceptance. So here Satan is offering everything to Christ, right? To prove that he, he well, he is the son, if he is, indeed he's the son of God, and all of this, right? And he showed it to him from the pinnacle. That's the offer. The condition he, he gives is in verse 6. For it is written, he, and that is God the Father that he, Satan is talking about there. He shall give his angels charge over you, right? And the condition continues. And of course, verse 7 is telling us that Christ rejected the offer. And his, his reason for rejecting the offer is that we should not tempt the Lord our God. Do not tempt the Lord your God. But verse 6 is clearly indicating the condition. The Lord your God, that is the he that precedes in verse 6. The Lord your God shall give his angels charge over you. I yield. Very clear. Okay. Any comments else? It, it, with respect to, uh, can you can you imagine what the devil was doing? Um, Jesus came to rescue, rescue humanity, rescue man. And uh, he essentially was offering a shortcut to 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 what the intended plan of Jesus was was to hmm. the the rescue was done through his death, and he telling well, listen, just bow down, and I'll give you back the give you back the kingdom. And um, as as bitter as the pill was, but Jesus wasn't going to use that route to restore to get back the kingdom. It was he would have gone. Prescribed way the father had, the way the father prescribed, then he would have worked it out that way. So it was kind of a very interesting exchange between the the both of them. Any additional well, comments? Yes. When we started, uh, that thought actually crossed my mind. You know, what if Christ took the bait? Because. <laughs> Um, I believe if from the time he said about his his foot hitting against the stone or um God sending angels, I believe that God, if if that were to happen, God would indeed do as he said, because that was his word. He would protect his son. However, the sad part is we would have been doomed because the atonement would not have taken place. Yeah, he, he would annul. That's the, how I see it. Yeah, he would annul the atonement because he, he couldn't. We couldn't restore the kingdom. He couldn't rescue human through through the. Through, he couldn't get back the kingdom through that method. There's only mm -hmm. one method he could do it. So it would. But God, you're talking about getting back the kingdom. Um, there might be some watching, or some who will watch who have not, who do not understand. Why Christ need to get back the kingdom? What kingdom are we talking about, and how does how did Satan get this kingdom? Was it Satan's to give? Well, once once Adam fell, once Adam fell, Alan, um, when Adam fell, it, it we we shifted we shifted it, it, things shifted from from Jesus Christ to to the devil. And Christ was Christ. The, the role of Christ was to restore, you know, restore, reconcile, bring it back to God. Okay. Uh, I, I, well, 
I'll put it in front of you. The king Adam was a vicegerent. Adam was not the king of king and lord of lords of the kingdom. He was an appointed vicegerent of the kingdom. Um, he lose that position to Satan. Satan is now had become the vicegerent. That means he, he God it, it still belonged to God, but he is in control. The Father sent Christ to bring it back, to take it back from Satan by way of the cross. Satan is offering it back to Christ. Look, you don't have to go through all that pain, all that suffering. People, people, your best friends um, denying you, some betraying you. You don't have to go through it through a broken heart. You don't have to go through, you, you don't have to do all of that to get back this kingdom. Just bow down and worship me. And I'll give it to you. Same deal he offered Adam. He offered him back again. <laughs> yeah. I'll give it back to you, right? Because you don't have to fight me for it. Just bow down and worship me. You don't have to go through the Father's wrath. And that's a terrible wrath, you know. You don't, mm -hmm. have, to, you don't have to experience the wrath of the Father to get back this. Just bow down and worship me. That, that, I mean, on the surface, a lot of people will pause and question and, and, and consider that offer that's put on the table. It's a shortcut, yes. It's a shortcut. But will it accomplish the goal? Kent. Will mankind be redeemed? Didn't come from the Father. Kingdom. And what are the gems of the kingdom? Christ didn't just come to take by earth. He came to take the people. And the only way he could do that is by tasting their death. Experiencing the death they are to experience. So does to save them from that death. Satan offer could not water. Christ would have failed if he had taken that course. Are you? Yeah, thanks for that. All right, I think we come to the end of the um, figure. We're pretty much done, right? 1230, 1235? So. Yeah, we can stop here and we just continue next week. It's a continuing series, so we... Uh... We, we've done over two hours of video, so I think it's a good place to stop. <laughs> All right. So let, me just, let me just mark that, that verse a little bit. One second, guys. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Pretty long session we had, but... Um, we're moving towards the end of chapter chapter four here. Uh, very very insightful. A lot of um, nuggets from here. Thanks for all those who participated again. Uh, let me pray to end this end this session. Eternal God and Father. Again, we are truly thankful for your presence here. <clears throat> 